two aircraft every day, two aircraft every day, including Sundays, bank holidays, and uh, this very much uh, reflects the travel patterns of John, and of course he knows then what our customers need, and John, I'm very pleased to have Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Hello, my name is John Leakey. Uh, I work with Stefan uh, here. I hope uh, you do enjoy the day, and I, in previous years, have spent a lot of time with you through the evening. As Stefan said, we have Delta here, and it's not just uh, Ed Bastian and his executive team, but we also have quite a few people from Delta Airlines for a delivery ceremony today of our first uh, uh, 340, uh, 242 ton 330, and uh, that's a, an airplane they're very proud of, and they'll be using it both on the Atlantic and the Pacific. So after the presentation this morning, unfortunately I'll have to escape for a while, but I will be back uh, in the afternoon, of course, when Ed comes to, uh, to make a small presentation. Now, uh, let's just take a, a quick look at the Airbus product line. What I'm going to be doing is talking about the industry in general, uh, not too many specifics, although that's difficult for me, so a few charts will slip in. Uh, and then we'll have different people going through a lot of detail for you on the various programs, with, of course, plenty of time for Q&A. And uh, in terms of meeting the customer needs, uh, I think uh, the key thing is to talk a little bit about our, our industry here. And some of you in the technical trade press, I think, you know, we sort of take this for granted. But more for the general price here, this really is intertwined with GDP development and the growth of the middle class. I'll be talking a bit more about that later. But uh, there are 3.3 billion passengers annually. Now, there are 7.2 billion people in the world. And it isn't exactly as if half the people fly every year. A few of us take more than one trip. Kieran Rao and myself, I think, yeah. and quite a few. 50 million tons of freight, uh, 2.4 trillion of global GDP, and 58 million jobs directly supported by aviation around the world. Now, as uh, uh, Stefan was about to start telling the story of uh, my 20 years here as commercial director of Airbus, uh, we did have less than 20% of the market uh, way back in 1995. But as you can see in this chart, by around 2000, we got to our goal of a, a stable duopoly, and I think that's about where we are today. Uh, I'm pleased to say that so far in 15, uh, through the end of last month, we're at 62% in terms of units, and uh, the other guy is about 38%. If you look at that uh, in terms of revenue, they do have a few more uh, wide-body aircraft building up that revenue, but uh, we're still ahead of 50% on the revenue side as well different categories here, and we show the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, we've got 73% in the single arm market. We've got uh, about 40% in the wide body market, but that uh, will not be the way the year will end. I think we'll be about 50-50 at the end of the year. And of course, we have to admit that they did get three freighter sales for their 747-8. As you know, we don't produce freighter. In terms of industry backlog, this is a record, uh, 6,399. But what's interesting is it's about the same as last year. I think last year was 6,386 or some number like that. So the record backlog that we have in the industry is being you know, uh, matched with production as production is starting to ramp up. So all those industry wags and consultants that talk about the fact that the backlog is out of control, I, I think they just don't know what they're talking about. In fact, you go to some of these ISTAT uh, meetings, you see 1,200 people in the audience. And uh, I don't know 1,200 people in this industry, but they're all there, and uh, you're all quoting them as the uh, well-known industry consultant from Dubuque, Iowa, or something like that. Anyway, um, and then there isn't one there, so I'm not trying to ridicule anybody. Uh, we have, in terms of that backlog, over 50% of the market. And this is a very interesting story as we talk about backlog. Now, here's the Airbus backlog of building up over the years, going all the way back to 1990. And as you can see, it really isn't that big cycle that people talk about, up and down and up and down. There was, in the early 90s, a little bit of a, a, a downtick, which uh, was probably fortunate, at least for my career, because uh, that brought me over here around 1994. 
and then we try to keep it flat because as you all know it's a lot easier uh, in Seattle to just lay off your workforce with two weeks notice and call them back in a year or two and most of the time they do come back and uh, you can run production up you can run production down we don't do that in Europe I'm not uh, at all convinced it is a good idea to do that even if we had that flexibility so we've been working very hard on trying to even in the downturns keep things smooth well that means you have to keep production smooth and that's what we're doing here if you look at the deliveries deliveries are production you don't see that up and down up and down that a lot of people will say well that's the industry it's cyclical when are we going to get the next downturn but going back to 1990 and you look at just Airbus in terms of our deliveries you don't see the up and the down so if some of those consultants from Iowa are talking about uh, the coming you know, reduction uh, of, uh, of production. Uh, they are not talking about Airbus. For the last 20 years, even 30 years, that has not been Airbus. Anyway, if we were to increase production, and that's uh, what we're talking about doing, and that line on the right-hand side uh, goes up to uh, rate, no, that's rate 50 right now, you can see that the rate 50 has been publicly announced seems not to be enough, which is why I, for one, am looking for a rate over 60. And I think it's more than justified if you look at that line going up, that goes up to about a rate of 63. And I think uh, that is clearly justified by the current level of backlog. You don't say, well, John, how many more airplanes are we going to sell to justify that? All we have to do is keep the backlog level which means I book as many airplanes per year as I deliver, and the backlog stays level, and we're justifying a rate above 60 on the single out per rent. So uh, we're studying it internally. We have to make sure our supply chain can do it, but I am highly confident that as long as we have a, a stable supply chain, the market can justify that rate. And one of the reasons is the market's been expanding quite a bit. This code is uh, 10 years ago, 2005. About 62% of all the aircraft deliveries were in the developed world, Europe and the United States. 62% of all our deliveries went there. 38% went to all the rest of the world. 10 years later, look where we are today. 42%, it's almost a complete switch, 42% are in Europe and the United States, and basically 60% are in the rest of the world. That is a dramatic shift, and those of you who are here from, uh, Emily from Taiwan, I met in the airplane yesterday coming in, and a few others from Asia, this is clearly the decade of the developing markets, and primarily Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and Going forward another 10 years, I think you'll see a lot of growth in Africa as well. And overall, not talking about regions, but the entire world, this industry has been doubling every 15 years. And I'm talking about the airline industry. Revenue passenger kilometers have been doubling since the dawn of the jet age every 15 years. So when somebody tells you we're going to see a worldwide global recession, Will aviation go down? Yes, it will. It always does. It's intertwined with the world economy. But if one of those uh, industry consultants that you love to quote says, we're going to see a, a, a real downturn in production, just ask them, well, what's going to happen to the GDP? Oh, no, that should grow about 2%. Then you know he doesn't know what he's talking about. GDP and aviation are intertwined. Aviation has become so big that it is a part of the GDP. You can't have gross domestic product growth around the world without aviation growing at the same time. And here's another way of looking at it. This is across the bottom line there, GDP per capita, you know, how much money the economy makes in various countries, with how many trips going up that vertical axis. So on the left-hand side, I'm not trying to confuse everybody, this is a logarithmic scale, and I know all of you probably failed uh, advanced math, uh, like me. Uh, I'm not an engineer. But uh, the, it, uh, India, for example, 0 0.6, actually says one in approximately one in 20 people make a trip every year on an airplane in India. 
So there are about 1.1, 1.2 billion people. One in 20 make a trip on average every year. Now we move up to China, the 0 0.26 and 25, that's one in four. So one in four people in China are making an airplane trip every year. Europe, it's about one of the, all people in Europe, uh, that's the number of trips. North America, well, 1.6, those little great dots above the line, you know, places like Australia, New Zealand, they travel two or more times uh, per year per person. Well, that's where we are today. If you look at this, going forward for about 20 years, you see India moves up to where China was. So now instead of one in 20 people making a trip every year in India, it's one in four people making a trip every year. And look at China. China moved up to where Europe is today. Every person in China makes a trip on average. And you know there are going to be a lot more people in China than the 1.3 billion people there are today, 20 years from now. That is the growth story of aviation. That's also the growth story of the world economy. You can't have growth in the world economy without growth in aviation. We are intertwined. So in 20 years from now, two-thirds of the people in the world will be making a trip every year. One of the reasons for this is also the growth of the middle class. Now if we look at this going forward, and this build isn't the way I want to build, so we'll just put it right back up there. Uh, look at the bottom line. You can see the bottom line is Europe, the black, all the way across. Notice it doesn't grow. Look at the line above it. That's North America, United States, right? It doesn't grow. 0 0.26, uh, 0 0.26, 0 0.25. Right? Then, look at that. Right? then look at the blue above that. That's the growth. That's the middle class in the emerging economies. Why do we have one uh, trip per person in Europe and 1.6 in the United States? Because in Europe and the United States, we have strong economies built around the middle class. And there's a lot of stories about, well, there's polarity going on. Uh, that's not compared to the developing uh, economies of the world. When you have a big middle class, you have people who travel for business, and you have disposable income, which means they travel for pleasure. So when you go to that blue bar above, you see the growth is in the emerging countries. That is going to be driving the growth in aviation. The growth in aviation will stay relatively flat in Europe and the United States, but it will grow tremendously uh, in the emerging markets around the world. Why? Because the middle class will grow dramatically in the emerging economies of the world. 1.5 billion middle class people live in the emerging world today. And that's, uh, that's supposed to be 2014 number up there. Someone dropped that off the slide too. But uh, 0 0.3 aircraft per million people in 2014 in India. Think about it. 0 0.3 aircraft per million people. 1.6. That's five times as many aircraft in China. Think about that. If you went back 20 years, 25 years ago, when I made my first trip to China in the autumn of 1994, first time I was ever in China in my life, and I was in bumper to bumper traffic going in from the airport, my hotel in downtown Beijing. I was in a car and the other traffic were on bicycles. But I tell you, it was tremendous traffic you'd have to creep along in your car. Today, I'm still in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic in Beijing when I go there, but they're all Audis, Mercedes, BMWs. It is an amazing growth in 20 years. That growth in that middle class that you see, you don't even see bicycles anymore. That growth in that middle class is driving the growth in aviation in China, and you can see the number right there on the chart. Now, to put it in reference, Europe would be about the same. 12.5 aircraft per million people. The future for India, the future for China, is up to that point that we're seeing in the United States and Western Europe. There's an awful lot of growth in travel, which is going to mean an awful lot of growth in demand for aircraft in India and China. I could also tell this story about all of Latin America and you'd see a similar pattern developing. That's the story for aviation. And there's one thing that we talk about, you know, suites, we talk about lay flat beds, 
We talk about the apartment, uh, the Etihad A380, which is uh, absolutely stunning and beautiful. We shouldn't forget that 90% of all those people that are traveling are in coach. 90% of all the people traveling are in coach. Oh, in fact, the number is over 90%. So we have to think about those people. We have to think about the quality of service we're giving them people, and we all know those people are very price sensitive as well. Now, if we look at business travel, let's go back uh, uh, to about 15 years or so here, let's go back to 10 years. About almost 10% of all the traffic was business class, first class traffic. Look what happened in the financial crisis. In that financial crisis, a lot of people stopped traveling that they really didn't, temporarily they did. What they did do is they shifted from the business class and the first class travel down to economy. And that's going to be driving the growth in premium economy, which we're seeing. I was out in China uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, several of the airlines were complaining about the fact that their business class is almost empty, because it's very clear uh, that the president of the country and the, uh, the state council are discouraging Luxury. Well, I'm not sure that uh, business class is luxurious travel, but the fact is they don't want to be seen there. And I came up with an absolutely brilliant idea, at least I thought it was, when we just call it premium economy and leave the seats in and just sell it as premium economy. And so we can't use the word premium. So, okay, well, a little bit better economy. But the fact is, a lot of companies are acting just like the Chinese government. Wait a minute. Do we all need to be traveling in first class? Do we all need to be traveling in business class? That went down, and it came up a little bit after the recession was over, but it didn't come up anywhere near the level it was at before. So, the wave of the future is going to be, what can we do in economy class? How can we make it more comfortable? How can we make it more cost effective? How can we actually draw more people in? Because we now are out of the recession. Around the world, we're out of the recession but we're not back into business class and first class travel the way we were before. So how can I make my passengers more comfortable? This isn't my little quiz just to keep you awake. This is our new ad campaign, which you'll be seeing uh, running very shortly and at the air show with billboards and, and the rest. How can I make my passengers more comfortable? No one knows. The answer is fly Airbus aircraft. Only Airbus offers more comfort in all classes on every model. It was obvious. That's an easy question. Make it hard. Okay, one of the reasons for that is that we have comfort economy. We have a minimum, minimum 18-inch seat in economy. You can make it bigger. All our standards, even our high-density configuration single aisles, you can you know, compress the seat pitch, but no matter what you do, you will always have that 18-inch width. It will always be more comfortable than our competitor. The 17-inch was designed back in the 1950s into the early 60s, built around fighter pilots. One thing you should know about American fighter pilots, they were selected especially then for being short and thin. Why? Because you wanted the brain up here. You didn't need a lot of bulk in a big guy in the airplane. That's why you know, short people are more intelligent than average. <laughs> so, the fact is, they were short, and they were thin. Well, some of us are still short, but we're not quite as thin anymore. Boeing forgot that. The fact is, we all need wider seats. So what fleet choice provides the most cost-effective solution for my network? Well, the A320 family, combining unbeatable fuel efficiency, no doubt about that around the world, from 100 to now 240 passengers in the 321, and unmatched comfort with 18 inches. No matter how dense you make that airplane, the seat will always be wider than my competitor's seat. And that means more comfortable. Airbus is the answer. Well, the single aisle market is uh, unbelievable. Um, almost uh, 12,000 orders, 6,500 aircraft delivered, about a 5,000 aircraft backlog, 99.7% dispatch reliability, a takeoff for landing every two seconds. Right? One every two seconds around the world, seven days a week, an A320 family is going to take off or land. It's amazing. 
And by the way, as some of you already know, but some of you may not know, we've increased the exit limits, which means you can put more people on the airplane, which means you can lower the ticket price, but you will always have that 18-inch width seat. You will always have the wider, more comfortable seat. We put plus four seats, up to 160 seats, uh, in the uh, uh, 319, poor Bombardier. Uh, 320 seats, uh, rather, an A320, 189 seats, and I'm annoyed about this because that's what we're promoting because we think you should have certain levels of seat pitch. Some airlines, especially low cost, aren't concerned about that. EASA has certified the airplane for, if you look at the fine print there, 195 seats. Yes, we can get, we have an exit limit in that airplane of 195 seats. Will you really make it tight? It could be down on 27 inch pitch. But you will always have the 18 inch wide seat and with new slimline seats. I assure you there will be a low cost carrier in the not too distant future that will get somewhere close to the 195 seats in the A320. My competitor is doing the same thing. Uh, they're saying uh, they can get up to 200. Well, they take the lavatories out too, but a short flight, who needs lavatories? But the fact is, they will have the 17 inch seat at 200. And not too many people will take the 200. We'll have the 18 inch seat at 195. And yes, I admit, not too many airlines will fly it with that density. Maybe more will do it at the 189. But the fact is, we have that capability. And now on the 321, we're up to 240 seats. 240 seats. By the way, for our uh, staff, people in the back, Stefan, uh, unless it's the lights here that I'm standing under, I think your temperature is going up in the room, you might want to warn them to turn it down, or it won't be my speech that will put them to sleep. <laughs> anyway, A320 production today is at forward rate 42. You all know that. We've announced publicly we're committed to rate 50 from the first quarter of 17, and you have the opinion of John Leakey about what we ought to do going forward, but we aren't committed to anything above 50 yet. We also have assembly lines in China, Tianjin, uh, capable of four aircraft a month, uh, could perhaps even go higher. And we have our new assembly line opening in Mobile. In fact, the building is up there now, and uh, we're going to have a dedication ceremony coming up shortly. But the first delivery of the first aircraft will be in the second quarter of 2016. That's right, we'll be producing airplanes now, single-aisle airplanes, right here in Toulouse, up in Hamburg, in Tianjin in China, and in Mobile, Alabama, in the United States of America. That's an amazing amount of single-aisle production. We don't build airplanes on speculation, we only build airplanes if we have firm orders in hand. That means an awful lot of demand for these products. They're taking the world by storm. The NEO is holding up at about 60% of the market. But we're also seeing a shift. Now these are our different categories. Go back to 2006, again about 10 years ago. We have trouble convincing ourselves when 10 years was 05, 04, 06. But let's say this is 10 years. 10% 10 with a 321. Then in the middle, we had about 43% the 320. And then look at the bottom, the 319. Let's fast forward now to 2016. Why did I say 2016? Because I know what production is going to be in 2016. The orders are there. Production is planned for 2016. It's moving up to about 44%. You can see we're closing in on 50% for the A321. About 50% for the A320. And the market for the 319 category airplane, again, too bad for my Canadian friends, has gotten very small. Aircraft are getting bigger. Demand for aircraft keeps shifting to bigger and bigger aircraft. Boeing is seeing the same thing, by the way, on their 737-700. So if you look at the Boeing product line, they'll say, well, there isn't much demand for the 737 MAX, maybe we won't even build it. 319, well, yes, we're going to build it. We have our A319 uh, Neo corporate jet, for one, that I announced at the eBay's uh, in Geneva just uh, about two weeks ago. But we also have our A320, and we have the new A321, including the long-range version, moving towards 50% of our production. So where my competitor talks about, there is really a sweet spot in the market right around this 180 to 200 seat category. 
in a single class configuration, we say, no, I'm sorry, the sweet spot in the market is bigger. It actually includes the 321 up to 240 seats in a single aisle. And how do we know? Because half of our production is moving up to that end, but the other half is down in the A320 family. So the real punchline in the story is that we have a product line in the single aisle market. My competitor has a pretty good product, but that's it. Not a family, the Dash 9 is not selling, and again, the Dash 7 Max is not selling. Which is one of the reasons why we have about 60% of the market in the Neo and the Max. And I'm getting really tired of the story that, well, Airbus started ahead of Boeing. We started at the end of December, I think 31st of uh, 2010, and Boeing didn't start until the summer of 2011. Oh yeah, that's six months head start. Well now, we're quite a few years into it, quite a few years, coming on six years here, and we've got 60% of the market. I think the industry has spoken. Whereas in the past, with the NG and the A320, I'll give Boeing credit for the fact that in the market we could stay about 50-50. Our airplane, their airplanes, some like the 737, some like the Airbus product, we shared the market. But when we brought out the NEO, we were able to do so much more with the NEO because we have more room for the bigger fan underneath, the higher bypass ratios. Uh, we were able to do more aerodynamic cleanup. We have the two engine options. We were able to do more with our A320 CO moving into NEO than they were able to do with the NG moving to the max. We opened up the gap. Don't you listen to my sales speech about it. Look at the numbers. The airlines are voting with their order books. 60% of the market is going to Airbus where it used to be a 50-50 split. Another reason for that is our A321LR. Why are we going to 50% of the market? Because we've done more with the A321. For high density, we've moved up to 240 seats. We've also made a long range version of the airplane. And we're going to replace the 757 200 you know, uh, advanced, high gross weight, whatever Boeing wants to call it. It's the three uh, 757s that are flying across the ocean today. They fly from America over to Europe, secondary city to secondary city. But they burn an awful lot of fuel. That's a range payload chart. Some of you techno press are familiar with that, others may not be. That's the range, of the, the horizontal line in the middle. Uh, is the max tax uh, line, how many passengers you can put in. So you drop straight down from that dot, and you can see that we're looking at about 4,000 nautical mile trip. That gets you across the uh, North Atlantic. So if we look at this now, with the A321, you can see we have virtually a match here. We've got 150 miles more range. We have a few more packs on board. It's essentially the same. So what's the difference? Well, we have the 18-inch wide seat, and they've got the 17-inch wide seat, that's one. Uh, we burn 30% less fuel on the same mission, 30% less fuel. We have lower maintenance costs. We have a modern, comfortable airplane. That's the reason why the A321LR is going to replace all of the 757s in the market over time. So about 600 of them. Whoops. And then, let me back this thing up. Can't back it up. And then we'll produce uh, a few more for other regions around the world, and you will quickly see about a thousand airplanes sold in that 321 LR category. You speak German, I speak English, they speak French. Traffic. That's the problem. <laughs> you need to find a French. <laughs> anyway, let's just give up and go to the next slide. What is today's best aircraft investment that ensures profitability? Another question to just keep you awake. Airbus wide bodies, simply the most modern and efficient available today. I you knew that. Another easy question. <laughs> I was going to back it up. <laughs> okay, too late. All right, the, the A330 10, 1,500 aircraft. 1,500 aircraft. That's a lot of aircraft. I had actually asked people to check, you know, were we the best selling wide body of all time? I think if you take for the 45 year history of the 747 program, they've sold by another 100, 150 airplanes, and that's about it. The, the A330 is very close to an industry record in terms of number of sales. And look at production today. Uh, you'll hear from the team, uh, 
uh, Eric uh, and his uh, program manager, uh, we're producing about 100 airplanes. Yes, we will take the rate down to about six a month, but that's still a very high rate. I see some people around here talk about, oh, gee, we're going down to six a month. I can remember this place talked about six a month on A330. People would have thought I lost my mind. You can't produce six and sell six a month for that. We have made this the world's best-selling wide body. And of course, one of the reasons is now our A330 Neo. We'll talk about that. But just like Boeing has with their 777-300ER moving to the X, we have our 330CO transitioning up to 330neo. But we'll keep the rate up. You'll see some orders announced uh, <coughs> by the A330CO by the air show, some significant numbers by the middle of the year. It's the 21st century travel experience. You can have the mood lighting. You can have the same IFE as you can on a 787 or a 350. You can have the same mood lighting. <coughs> And you can have the 18-inch seat that you can't have on the 787, that you can't have on the 777. We could, but nobody's putting them in anymore. In terms of the uh, uh, product strategy, today, as I said, Delta is here. President Chief Operating Officer and his team to pick up the first 242-ton A330. And then, of course, we bring out, in December of 2017, the A330 NEO. The same interior as a 350. Most passengers getting off the 350 and the next sector is going to be on a 330neo will not notice the difference. They'll probably assume they're still on an A350. And I think most of you have seen the A350 cabin is setting new standards in elegance and comfort. And we will improve our fuel burn by 14%. That exactly matches the 787-8. We'll have the same number of seats as the 787-8. We'll have the same range as the 787-8. We'll have the same fuel burn as a 787-8, but those seats will be 18 inches wider, and the interior will look like an A350. And if you're trying to sleep on a day flight, you'll have those very advanced mechanical window slides that come down and go totally flat. Anyway, the Delta order, we're very proud of 25 A330 Neos, 25 A350s, Almost everybody thought that they were going to buy the 787. They even have 787s on order. But after studying the numbers, they decided the best airplane for their Pacific routes would be the A350. And the best airplane for their Atlantic routes, and Atlantic routes go all the way from Atlanta to the Middle East, would be the A330 Neo. A great combination with the ability of pilots to move back and forth from one aircraft type to another. A330 Neo. A commercial success. You saw the air show last year. We've got all the key leasing companies on board with the program because they're betting on the future. They know a good airplane when they see it. They know an airplane that's going to drive profitable economics. Yes, we can do everything a 787-8 can do with wider seats. We can do it at much lower capital cost. That was not lost on the key leasing companies around the world. We also have many customers on board. You can see we're about 150 orders, and we're not even trying. As you can imagine, we're pushing the 330 seal right now to fill up that production gap until we start uh, delivering the NEO. Then we have the A350, the extra that makes the difference. Almost 800 orders right now, comfortable 18-inch seat. Did I forget to mention that? 18-inch seat, 25% lower cost than the 777-300ER. Uh, Stefan doesn't like me to say competition, 777-300ER. New airframe, aerodynamic systems and engines, 40 customers for the program. Remember, over 100 for the A330, and the A350 will get over 100 as well uh, during its life. Economy class, 18-inch comfort seat, uh, very, very nice interior. That's at 9 abreast with 18-inch. Oh, you said the uh, 787 could do 9 abreast. Yes, it can do 9 abreast. And they struggled to get to 17 inches. We had one airline operator, if you went to their website, was advertising their luxurious 16.9 inch seat. Until we started making presentations like this, they realized they would take that off of their website. I actually told the CEO of an airline to operate 787s that I couldn't get into the economy class seat. He said, you can get in, you just can't get out. It's <laughs> probably true. <laughs> so here we have the 351,000. 
It is the reason for the 777X. You see, competition drives the industry. It really does. The 777-300, I gotta admit, is a good airplane. They were selling extremely well. Charged too much for it, but you know, they were getting away with it. And we take it on 340 out of production. And then we bring out the 351-1000. Look at the range payload. You can see that the uh, it's almost identical of the uh, Max Pax line. They're sitting on top of each other. You can see the total payload going up the top. They're about the same. You can see the range were a little bit longer, but not an awful lot. They're essentially the same range payload chart. The only difference being that we've got that new modern interior. We, uh, by the way, I gave them the 10 abreast. We've got the 18-inch seat. They've got the 17-inch seat. And we've got 25% lower operating costs. Well, they're looking at that and saying, you could go from Singapore to Toulouse, or Toulouse to Singapore. Now, that could also be Paris, or that could be uh, London to Singapore, for the same number of passengers, with wider economy class seats, and you could do a 25% lower seat mile cost. Or how many more 777-300s is Singapore Airlines, for example, going to buy if this is their alternative? It became very obvious that Boeing needed to do something or they were going to lose that 777 market. So they stretched the airplane. They put a new wing on the airplane. And they came up with a very interesting airplane. But did anybody ask them to put more seats in the airplane? Not obvious. It's 35 tons heavier. It has about 35 more seats. Why do they put more seats in the airplane? Because they need to get the seat mile cost down. If you're going to build this airplane bigger, if you're going to have this new big wing on it, you're going to put all these things there that fold up and down and do all sorts of stuff like that, you need to have, you're going to have a higher trip cost, so you need to have more seats. Why have we not stretched a 321,000? We study it back and forth. We talk to airlines. It's not obvious that the world would be saying, you know, we need more seats than we had in the 777-300 than you have in the 321,000. No, Boeing said we need to put more seats in to get a decent seat mile cost to justify the higher trip cost. So we're studying that, but right now we have a very, very competitive airplane. That will also be their biggest airplane. They're clearly dropping the 747-8 packs at least. So that will be their largest airplane. So maybe they say, oh, I can justify a few more seats anyway. But we've got our A380. Passengers love it. It's sitting at the top of our product line. Is it a big market? It's not a gigantic market. But if aviation doubles every 15 years, the market will need it. It needs it today. Airlines who have it love it. And by the way, an A380 is taking off her landing every three minutes, 24-7. Every three minutes, an A380 is taking off her landing somewhere in the world. I bet you didn't know that, especially uh, some of you uh, like Bloomberg who like to trash the age rating. They look who's making this. Uh, the fact is, passengers love the airplane. I'm afraid it's just not a lot of fun. Anyway, if you look at it, A380s are securing a growing capacity share at major airports. Let's look at Frankfurt. 10% of this is the long haul movement. I'm not uh, counting the little. Uh, short flight, so it's over 2,000 nautical mile trips, right? 10% percentage of airport movements are A380s, and then you can see 5% in Hong Kong, even though Cathay hasn't bought the airplane yet, but they are pretty obviously uh, aware of this, and we're talking to them. 7% London Heathrow, 5% in Los Angeles, 1 in 20 at Los Angeles are A380s. <coughs> Paris, 10% of uh, low-haul aircraft movements for A380s today. Interesting. But how, what percent of the passengers? What percent of the passengers? 16% in Frankfurt. So 9.6% of the aircraft movement, but 16% of the passengers. Go over to Paris. We're 10% of the aircraft, long-haul aircraft movements, but we're 17% of all the long-haul passengers are flying on the A380. We're doing more with less. What makes noise at an airport? It's an aircraft movement. What creates cost at an aircraft uh, at an airport? It's aircraft movement. What <coughs> creates congestion in the airspace or at the airport? It's aircraft movements. If traffic is going to double every 15 years, as it has, and by the way, as Boeing forecasts it will, and as all the engine manufacturers 
And every independent forecaster is saying, about every 15 years, going forward, next 20 years, traffic is going to double. How are we going to do that? Double the number of aircraft movements? Impossible. That percentage is going to shift more and more to bigger aircraft. Bigger aircraft like the A380. And 10 years, 10 years after the first flight, passengers go out of their way to fly the A380. Even some airlines who have said, well, I've got enough A380s, and there are some out there who said that. Uh, Emirates is not one of them, by the way. Uh, tell me that passengers go out of their way to fly on an A380. Yes, we know passengers go out of their way to fly on an A380. We can charge a premium to go on the A380. They can. It's inevitable that they'll all be flying more A380s going forward. There are 42 megacities in the world today that are carrying the long haul traffic. It's 90% of the long haul traffic. Little notes at the bottom, cities with more than 10,000 passenger boardings going more than 2,000 nautical miles. That's long haul. So over 2,000 miles long haul, we call it. And if you've got 10,000 passengers going more than 2,000 nautical miles of flights, then that's considered a, a long haul trip. Over 90% of those are going through these 42 hubs around the world. You're not going to do that much long haul from Toulouse. You know, Toulouse to Guangzhou is never going to be a long haul non-stop flight. If it is, it's going to be me and my private jet. But that's going to be about it. If we go forward, oh, I'm sorry. Why do we keep doing this? The question and answer, there goes the answer, there's what I want. The A380 uh, to 42 megacities, ah, 2023. That's the chart I was looking for. What's going to happen? 2023. That's basically 10 years from now, because we have trouble with what year is 10 years. Anyway, the fact is, approximately 10 years out of the future, that's almost going to double. But it's going to be 95% of all the trips. Again, sorry, Toulouse didn't make the cut. But there are some big cities. Look down in Spain there. You can see that Madrid that I've got in there. It looks like Barcelona's on, the, uh, on there. By the way, uh, Emirates does 380 from Dubai to Barcelona. A 380 flies in to Barcelona. You can see uh, others in Europe, you can see the United States, you can see who they are in Australia, out in Asia. 95%, 71 megacities in 10 years' time. And hopefully, I'm going to get, yes, and 10 years after that, it'll be 90 megacities. 90 megacities, that'll be virtually all of the long-haul traffic will be flying through those. Yeah, there'll be the occasional A321 going across the North Atlantic, but that's not going to be a high percentage of the volume of revenue passenger kilometers in flights. Those are the cities that have to be covered with A3s. There is no other way to do it. We're not going to increase it, uh, increase the count of 777Xs. Uh, that's only 35 more seats than the 777 today. So if we can't double the number of 777s flying, if we can't double the number of 350s flying every 15 years, we have to shift the traffic to larger aircraft. That is the case for the A380, and it just so happens that the A380 offers you the most comfortable interior, it offers the airline the lowest cost, and it also offers the airline the most passenger preferred airplane in the world today. And there's a new movement going to premium economy. Remember, 90% plus of all the people are flying in economy today. What are the airlines doing? They're realizing that. How can I get more money out of economy class? Well, maybe they won't spring for business class, but maybe if I just charge them a couple hundred euros more, I can give them a little bit uh, more pitch, I can give them a business class meal, it doesn't cost that much. It goes to me, travel business class, you know it's not that great. The fact is, you can get more money. The world is shifting to premium economy. It has to, with over 90% in economy, and the airlines desire to get more money out of economy, and everybody in economy is starting out with, what's the lowest cost I can possibly get my ticket? And then after a while, well, you know, at this 14-hour trip, geez, you know, if I got free drinks, and I've got a better meal, a little bit more leg room, maybe it's worth a couple hundred euros. And that's the way it goes, the case for premium economy. Here's our 11 abreast. I know some of you, I don't want to mention a, a particular uh, you know, people by name here, uh, but the fact is, when we put 11 abreast in, 
we have a wider seat than you get on the all new, all singing and dancing 777X. Yes, you do. You get a wider seat than they get with their 10 abreast. They're a little over 17, and we're at 18 plus. At 10 abreast, by the way, you're 19, 19 and a half inch in a condo. So when we talk about apples to apples comparison, of course you put in 11 abreast. And then someone's going to say, oh, gee, but I don't know. Would anybody ever sit in that middle seat? Yes, they would. How do I know that? Because all those DC-10s around the world had five abreast in the middle. All those MD-11s had five abreast in the middle. All those L-1011 Tri-Stars had five abreast in the middle. And you know what the airlines discovered? That you had to be about 93% load factor before you start filling up that middle seat. And you actually got people uh, who travel together, families who asked, who asked for that. Did anyone ever, traveling by itself, sit in that middle seat? Yes, me. I was on a, a, a DC-10 once, and uh, it was one of those early days when they had the flying pubs and everything else, and the airlines weren't smart enough to restrict it just to first class. So I waited until about 30, 30 seconds before the seat belt sign went off, 30 seconds before. Jumped up, tripped over the two people next to me, ran to the bar, and got a seat in the bar where I stayed until I had to descend the landing. Uh, so it does work. Now the fact is that that middle seat, it's going to be as comfortable as the middle seat over there uh, on the left side, as comfortable as we the right side. I prefer a window or aisle, most people will, but the difference in the quint doesn't really make that much difference. The fact is uh, families like it, and that quint will only be filled up when you're about 93% load factor. No, I'll talk as long as I want. Thank you. <laughs> but it won't be too much longer. What happens to the A380 when you put in the uh, premium economy? Well, think about the math of this. We've got all that extra floor space. It's the biggest airplane. So it's going to be the least compromised. So if you're on a 777, if you're on an A350, and you take your three-class configuration and you make it a four-class configuration, you're going to reduce the seat count. But proportionally, you will reduce it less on an A380 because you've got more space to work with. So, 11 abreast seating with four-class configuration A380 sitting there with 544 seats, more than a lot of airlines are flying today with the 10 abreast configuration. And look what happens to our A350. Our A350, four-class, about the 290 seats, the 777-9X is around 300 seats. They might argue 305, I'm sure Kieran would say it's 295. The fact is, uh, they got pushed down. 777-300 becomes too small, that around 270, 275 seats. So if we are moving towards premium economy, and we are moving towards premium economy, the A380 becomes relatively even more persuasive in terms of economics and more comfortable for the passenger. Because again, even with 11 abreast, you've got 18 inches. So how can my airline manage cost and maximize revenue? Well, it was obvious. 58380 with the lowest cost per seat, an unrivaled passenger appeal. Now, one last thing, and really Stephanie is the last point I'm going to make here. It only takes 15 minutes, so kind of okay. uh, This is an interesting fact. Think about this. 18 inch comfort economy seating delivered to airlines, okay? This is Boeing. So I go back the years, go back to 1995, uh, my first full year as commercial director here. Uh, Boeing was somewhere around close to 80% of all the wide body aircraft they were delivering had a minimum of 18 inch economy seats. Then back up there by 2000, they were over 80% premium, rather uh, 18 inch seats. Okay, Boeing knew that was uh, uh, very important. They then were trying to improve the economics of the 777. They said, hey, we could squeeze in 10 abreast. That's when they announced it. Notice what happened. Nothing. The airlines didn't believe them. Very few airlines, after they announced that, tried the 10 abreast. The ones that did, they didn't like it. Several tried it and switched back. Because if everybody else had 18-inch plus seats, and now you're down to 17-inch seat, 10 abreast, people were complaining. Then to make, when the 787 came out, they had it at 8 abreast. Go back and look at the literature. They never talked about 9. It was 8 abreast. That was the standard. 
think about that. By the way, our 350 was very similar. Then they said, no, no, we've got to improve the economics. What's wrong with 16.9 inch seats? It looks great on paper. And you can draw some great pictures with people sitting there, relaxed, and dozing off, drinking their hand. Yeah. The fact is, it doesn't work in reality. And to make the numbers work, they've been shipping it out. They've been convincing airlines you've got to have it. And they're helping to drive the premium economy trend. Because the theory is, if you're really a backpacker, if you don't care, we can put you in the back the cheapest possible seat. And then if you do complain on your next trip, you want something better, we'll sell you for a couple hundred euros more, a premium economy seat. There is some truth to that. But then with the uh, 777X, they said, no, no, the new standard is 10 abreast. Why is the new standard 10 abreast? Because they need to get the seat mile cost down because they have a higher trip cost on the 777X. Much higher trip cost than they have on the 777. They've got to do something about it. They've got to be competitive. And look what happens by 2025 if we just follow their trend. They're saying 9 abreast to 787-9, 10 abreast on the 787 uh Triple Seven X, right? So essentially, everything will be budget economy out of Seattle. Look at Airbus. We're staying about 90 percent, 18 inch plus seat. Can you get 10 abreast on A350? Yes, you can. Do we recommend it? No. Can you get nine abreast on an A330? Yes, you can. Do we recommend it? Yes, because you've actually got a pretty nice seat at nine abreast. Uh, uh, on the A330. It's very comfortable interior. A lot of budget airlines use it, etc. In fact, I think it's much more comfortable than you'll see at 10 abreast on a triple set. Anyway, Kieran can answer those questions. He's speaking right after me. But we are maintaining the standard of at least 8 inch, uh, 18 inch. And we will so. I think that's right, not 8 inch. 18 inch seat. And we will do so as long as I'm commercial director. Because as you all know, I cannot fit into the 17 inch seat with all these trunks. So there it is. You don't have to compromise on comfort. And a two hour lunch, you would never accept that. Why would you do that on a 12 hour trip? Think about it. Why would you do that? Anyway, that's our product line. Stefan wants to uh, let you know, that's why he's standing now, that this is my last slide. We have. The undisputed industry flagship of the A380. Passengers love it. It has the lowest seat mile cost of any airplane today. It is the only way we're going to be able to handle a doubling of traffic, traffic every 15 years. The only way. Then, of course, we have our wide body family, our A350. We think we've really got a winner. So far, you know, knock on wood here, we've had a flawless introduction of the airplane. Passengers are loving it. Dispatch reliability is good on the airplane. Our ramp up, the computer's crossed, is going very well so far. And then we have our A330 CO, the regional fly, our A330 NEO that can match the cash operating cost, fuel burn, economics of a 787-8 and range at about 25% lower capital cost, a $25 million lower price, something like that. Think about the competitive position that puts us in. And then, of course, we have the industry-leading single-aisle product line. There is no sweet spot in the market, as our competitor would say. There are sweet spots in the market, both that 320 spot and that 321 spot. And I think uh, only our colleagues uh, in Canada believe that there is a market down there in the lower end. So looking at it from our point of view, Looking at, from I think, an independent outsider's point of view, that's the product line that puts us in very good shape for the next 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, John, for your presentation. Setting the tone this morning. And uh, I would like to start the Q&A session, but before doing so, you have seen the new advertising campaign we are about to launch uh, for Le Bourget. And I'm very pleased also that we have Tim Orr here around. He is Head of Business and Branding Communication here at our Communication Department, and he is ready to answer your questions on this one. But before going there, questions to John. And please don't forget to mention Tim, your name. Tim, you got a question we know from Reuters. Okay. Uh, Tim Hafer from Reuters. 
I'll spare you the biography. <laughs> um, Tim started with the word, he was a very young man. Yeah. Yeah. Worked his way up. <laughs> um, uh, you, once you were showing us the A351000 payload range chart, I think you said that you'd given them 10 abreast, but I believe that the slide said that it was based on 9 abreast. So the A350, no, the A350 is based on 9 abreast. Everything you've seen is based on 9 abreast. Ah. I did say it is possible to put in 10 abreast. No, no, seven, against the 7300ER. Yes. Was the figures that you gave us based on 10 abreast? I certainly hope so, because that's the ones we should be using. Alan, were they based on 10 or 9? He doesn't know. He'll look it up and get back. Um, so just a couple of questions. When do you expect to start delivering more aircraft than Boeing again? What year? Oh, I wouldn't uh, forecast that. It's not a real race on deliveries. But if you look at the fact that most of the volume in, is in single aisle, and the NEO is outselling the MAX, you know, basically uh, 60 to 40. Think about that, uh, 40 to 60 airplanes, 50% more. Uh, it's when we start ramping up the production on the NEO, it's pretty obvious. Well, you're, you're going to hit the sort of plateau of production on the NEO in 2018, so is that when you would be delivering more than Boeing again? Again, I don't have the numbers at the top of my head, but you could probably okay. start plotting it out and looking at as we're ramping up the NEO, if we maintain the fact that we've been outselling them by 50%, you know, 6 to 40 is outselling by 50%, <coughs> that's where the volume of units are. It's pretty obvious that as we come up to the full production, we'll be delivering more than that. Okay, then just a couple on the A330. You said that you're considering an increase in production of the A320. Are you also considering a further decrease in the production target for the A3? 30. And what's happened to the A330 regional? Uh, the A330 regional is a great airplane. We've got several campaigns underway. I expect to have an announcement, uh, at least by the air show, on the A330 regional. We also have campaigns underway on other 330 COs. So we're pretty, pretty happy with the program. But again, we don't build on speculation. We don't build white tails. So if you see the orders not materializing, then production will go back. If you see more orders materializing, production will go up. Now we give to Robert Ward. What's your journal? Hi, John. Um, I first one is to follow up on that uh, Tim's question on 330. So the significant 330 orders you were talking alluding to in Paris, they're not going to be enough yet to fill up the bathtub fully at rate six. You, you would still have to do some additional sales work for, to maintain that, is that correct? Well, there are two speculators in there. The orders that I'm going to announce at the issue, which we don't know what they are or how many they are, and if they don't materialize or if they don't materialize in what quantity, will I have to adjust production? No, no, I was Maybe. saying, I mean, I mean, no, I'm saying assuming, yeah. The, all the things you think you're going to book, or you may book. If I have everything I, I'm working on now that I think is likely, I do not see any reduction in production. Okay, fair enough. And then on 380, what do you see in terms of order activity this year? Uh, we should have some orders for the A380 this year. Specify how many? <laughs> <laughs> Up to 200. <laughs> No, it's uh, it, it, no. It, I'm just joking. <laughs> All of you hitting the send button. <laughs> the, the fact is, uh, there is demand for the A380 out there. We've got several campaigns underway. There, there's a lot of demand for an airplane that we haven't yet launched. Next to Andrea. Did you just say there's a lot of demand for an airplane we haven't just launched? Haven't yet launched. Haven't yet, yet launched. launched. Do you mean the A388 Neo? Wait. Well, I confuse you too much, right? Yes. Okay. So, again, I was joking. Okay. Anyway, my, well, my question is about the, the A380 NEO. At one point, Tim had said he expected you guys to make a decision on whether you would re-engine by the summer. Can you give us some indication of where you are in talks with Emirates and whether it would be feasible to invest up to 2 billion euros, about 2 billion euros, in putting a new engine in the A380 for one customer, even a mega customer? Well, to begin with, I've said publicly already, that uh, it's a very hard sell to our board uh, to do anything for one customer, even a big customer. But the fact is, Tim has made it very clear uh, that he sees demand uh, for 200 just from Emirates for that airplane. Uh, we are not in the position right now to 
to make a commitment on launching it or not launching it. We're still studying the business case. Next to Karen Walker, Fashion Sport World. Hello, John. Um, can, can I just talk about the, uh, the 757 gap uh, coming up? Um, the US carriers that are still operating that aircraft on long routes mm -hmm. still don't seem convinced that there is um, a, a, a good fill for that. Can you talk to that against you know, the A321 long range? Sure. Uh, virtually every one of those 757s will be replaced <laughs> by either an A321 or a Wi-Fi. And uh, uh, I don't see anything coming out of Seattle that will compete. And the fact that we can do the same mission that's being done today uh, with an A321 or A321 compared to a 757, we burn 30% less fuel. We have the 18-inch wide seat versus the 17-inch seat. I think it is inevitable that uh, they will go with the A321. Next goes to Stefan via DPA. Uh, hi. The question from here uh, concerning the A320 and A320 Neo. Uh, you said you would push up the production experts uh, to more than 60 a month. So now we have the 50 inside. How yeah, sure the 50 inside. Yeah. The 50 inside, and you look for uh, increasing it to 60. Yeah. Uh, have you? Uh, how sure are you if this will uh, realize? And have you a time range when uh, the 60 could be reached? We are studying uh, the uh, business case for it, the supply chain in particular, and uh, I'm sure we'll have an announcement one way or the other before the end of the year. I think I showed you pretty persuasively uh, that there is demand there. If you look at those charts again carefully, you can see this demand there to go above rate 60. Uh, the question is, can we, can our supply chain follow us? We don't like to promise an airplane and then discover some supplier can deliver his part and everything backs up. Next question to Tim Rollins. Hi, uh, Tim Rollins from Aerospace. Uh, obviously, Emirates is your biggest A380 customer, but uh, I'm just thinking, could it become a competitor in the future when they start uh, kind of offloading secondhand uh, A380s on the market and start you know, coming through? Uh, how does that kind of play into any kind of uh, decisions about uh, A380 Neo? No, I, I don't see uh, Emirates as a competitor. Uh, but those aircraft, used aircraft, I, I see as a big opportunity. If, if you take an airplane, uh, say, its half life point, let's say some of those airplanes, uh, if you look it up online, you can figure out uh, what they were financed for. Uh, let's say that uh, at their half life point, they're coming back out and we're being leased at $100 million. Okay? Well, $100 million less or will pay you, using about the 1% rule, about a million dollars a month. Well, okay, you get 3D for a million dollars a month. Well, really, it's, you know, half life, but still, it's perfectly serviceable. It works, passengers like it, they don't know how old it is, and everything. You know, clean up the interior, repaint it. Uh, what's a 777-300 ER going for right now? It's going for more than a million dollars a month. So I think we open up a real unique opportunity here uh, that some operators who have never even considered an A3 before uh, are starting to look at the fact that, gee, if about the, the rental per month for the 777 ER, I can have an A3. Maybe there are some routes I should try out with this. So I see it's a great marketing opportunity. I can't wait to get there. Next question. Uh, good morning. Uh, Anirban Chaudhary. Uh, put your hands up wherever you are. Ah, there you are. Anirban Chaudhary from the Economic Times India. Mm -hmm. uh, you sound very optimistic on the Indian market. Uh, uh, since 2011, you know, the only mega orders that have come in have been from Indigo. And that's sort of driven your market share ahead of Boeing. Now there are, you know, recently there have been six new licenses given. There have been two airlines which have come, AirAsia India and Vistara. Both of them are using Airbus planes. Uh, so when do you see the next big round of orders from India? You don't buy anything. Okay, well, uh, there's a Q&A for uh, Dr. Kieran Rao, our expert in India, coming up after his presentation. He'll go into that in more detail. But I see that market developing. It's developing more slowly than, I, than China. I think that there are some infrastructure problems, there are some regulatory problems that, that need to be fixed. And uh, I see this new government is moving in the right direction to cut out bureaucracy and uh, to improve infrastructure in the country. 
uh, as we have a very large percentage of the market, as India starts growing more rapidly, that's catching up with China, I see uh, Airbus sales uh, improving dramatically. Uh, with the new government coming in, there's, there's this make in India concept, you know, uh, the Prime Minister is really pushing uh, companies overseas to come and construct. So, right. do we see in the near future uh, some stage at which Airbus begins to sort of work on its MRO or remember, a center? Remember, remember we have a training center in India, uh, we have a big engineering center in India, we have uh, some components uh, being built in India right now. So, we are really partners with the Indian economy. We just wish the economy would grow a little more rapidly, catch up with China. Thank you. Okay, good. Final question, the Q&A goes over to Kuli from here. Good morning, Jamie Ragone from Solar Energy Control. Hi, two questions. About A380, uh, please could you confirm, till now this year, did you get any new order for 380 or, or not? I did not understand. Okay, Dr. Rao, uh, that's a question for you. Okay, uh, he's going to research that. Uh, uh, the other no, no, <laughs> any of Okay, and the other question is uh, about um, Litalia Etihad. Uh, Etihad uh, seems to be willing to uh, to lease some of uh, its aircrafts or its orders to Alitalia. Uh, so would the uh, bus agree with that? Uh, again, commercial negotiations have to remain private, but. Uh, I have an understanding, uh, I'll say the, the highest level, uh, with uh, James Hogan, that he does have some ability under certain conditions to move airplanes around within the group of uh, companies that he is invested uh, in. I don't want to go into the actual details of that, but uh, I think you can see that there would be possibilities there. Thank you, John. Before closing the Q&A session... Oh, yes, 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 wait. We have an announcement to make. Okay. Uh, I think uh, some of you may know Francois Caudron here. Uh, Coudron, I know it's mispronounced. How do you say it? Caudron. Okay. Francois uh, from the 350 program. From the very beginning, uh, he moved over from marketing to the program. And some of you may have seen him involved in the customer focus groups where we met on a regular basis with the airlines to try who was buying the airplane, even some who were thinking about it to get regular input on how to build the airplane that made it really work to an airline standard. Uh, I think that the fact that uh, Akbar is saying glowing things about the airplane is proof that Francois has done a fantastic job along with the rest of the A350 program team. And we've now moved him over to be head of our marketing group. So uh, he'll be starting, I believe, on June 1st, officially, next week. Next week. Uh, so perhaps he could say just a few words to remind some of you who he is and what he's been doing. Francois? Congratulations. Oh, we did it that way. Right. <laughs> Thank you, John. So a few words about who, I'm, who am I. Um, so Caudron, you know, some of you may Pronounce want to... Correct, right? <laughs> correct. Some of you may want to Google it and search it, and you will find out that it used to be an aircraft manufacturer. So um, bear that in mind. Um, no relation, direct relation with that branch of the Caudron, but at least you will remember how to spell it and write it. Um, the only relation I would have is the passion about aircraft. So I'm basically an aeronautical engineer, graduated from the University of Liège in Belgium and Cranfield in the UK, started my career at Airbus in 1990, and from day one I've always been looking for customer-facing jobs. So I started in the customization business, and when I was of us, had some consultancy experience, some sales in aviation with the Shell Aviation Company, selling lubricants and specialties to airlines. And I moved back into Airbus and worked for John as a contract director in the Middle East region. Um, then held the position of head of pricing, working with Kieran, and then eventually moved to the 350 program, like John was saying, it was a fantastic journey. Um, and lastly, I was holding a position in procurement, um, being the prime interface for all the Airbus programs to the procurement organization. So with those diverse experience, I'm delighted and thankful to have been given the opportunity to join the marketing. And let's say I'm looking forward to interacting with you guys in the near future. Thank you.